This lecture in Climate and Earth 401 is about angular momentum. It's really about angular momentum per unit mass because we're going to keep with the convention that we are going to want to look at force per unit mass. Force per unit mass is really acceleration. Momentum per unit mass is really velocity. It's what we will really be looking at here is angular velocity or angular momentum per unit mass. Newton's laws of motion tells us that momentum is conserved in an inertial coordinate system. A coordinate system is simply our choice of how we want to observe and characterize motion. In an absolute sense, momentum doesn't really care about how we choose to observe it. Hence, what we have to do is once we have chosen a coordinate system, we have to be very careful about how we relate momentum to our coordinate system, which is really to our point of view. We choose to use a rotating coordinate system because it's where we live and it's where we observe. When we cast momentum into a rotating coordinate system, we call it angular momentum. When we cast forces into a rotating coordinate system, we rename them torque. Like momentum, angular momentum is conserved in the absence of torques or forces. When we talk about force, we talk about something that can change the velocity of a mass. When we talk about torque, we talk about something that can change the angular velocity of a mass. What we will be talking about comes from the consideration of the conservation of momentum of a body that is in constant body rotation in a polar coordinate system. If this is obscure, if it's cloudy, if you need to review it, then I suggest an introductory physics text. We're going to start with this coordinate system, which is simply a two-dimensional polar coordinate system that we are looking down upon the circle from above. Again, this is a two-dimensional coordinate system. If you go back to the lecture on the rotating coordinate system, this is the x-y coordinate system, and it's rotating around a z-axis, which is pointing up at you. In this, we have an angular velocity of omega, this little omega. We have that there is the change in the angle theta here. We have the radius of the circle, and we look at the tangential velocity out here on the edge. If you look at the speed here, which is indicated by these brackets here as representing the magnitude of the vector v, the speed here is omega times r. If this seems obscure to you, I suggest that you go back and review an introductory physics textbook and perhaps just sit down and draw some pictures and think this through. If this is in constant body rotation, then going from V here to V here, still tangential, it may keep the same speed, but the velocity changes which is this delta v here, because if you were to take this vector and move it here, then look at that vector, and then do a vector subtraction to look at the difference, you would get a delta v. Hence, there is a change in velocity coming simply from the coordinate system. So we want to take this idea that we just introduced and cast it to the Earth. So we will take this as a spherical Earth. Here's the polar axis around which things are rotating, and we will have a big omega here as the angular velocity for the Earth, and we're going to ask the question, what is the appropriate radius of rotation for a parcel on the surface of the Earth? We will pick an arbitrary place to put that parcel, which will be here. Here will be the radius, which is the appropriate radius to look at the rotation, because here's that axis. And you'll see, depending upon which latitude you might choose, that radius will be different. The radius is largest at the equator, and it goes to zero at the pole. We will have a vector r, a large vector r, 
which is the direction away from the axis of rotation. So here is the axis of rotation, here is our vector r. If we look at the radius at this particular latitude, hence we have here phi is equal to latitude, a is the radius of the earth, and what we want now is the radius around which this parcel on the surface is rotating, then r is equal to a cosine phi. This is basic trigonometric functions of the relationship of the hypotenuse a, the angle phi, which is here and here, and the relationship between the hypotenuse and either the adjacent or the opposite side from that angle. We're now going to place a coordinate system on the surface of the Earth. So this is our tangential coordinate system. And in this representation, this is the local vertical. This is the south-north, and we are just imagining the x, the west-east. I have placed the vector r again on the surface, and so this is the r vector pointing out along that axis of rotation. Using a little geometry, this is the angle phi again up here, because we have a parallel line here, parallel line here, and hence we just know through our basic geometry that that angle is replicated there. And what we want to do is to calculate the components of a vector of magnitude b that is aligned in this direction r. So we're going to just assume a magnitude of b, we're just going to call it b as an abstract variable, a symbol. It's going to be aligned with this angle r. Hence the z component, the local vertical component, will be b times the cosine of phi. The y component in the south-north direction is b times the sine of phi, so that's this one. Now we're going to ask the question, what is the speed of this point right there due only to the rotation of the Earth? And the speed, the magnitude of the velocity, is going to be equal to omega, the rotational velocity of the Earth, times r this vector here. So you can see, depending upon which latitude we choose, if we choose a latitude down here in our solid body rotation, the speed is going to be larger because r is larger. Omega will be the same everywhere, and this is completely analogous to the circle we looked at at the very beginning of this lecture. And you can imagine that we're just looking at a pile of, of circles. The one with the largest radius will be at the equator, and again, the smallest will be at the pole. Hence, angular momentum per unit mass, essentially the, the velocity, using L as the symbol for angular momentum, is speed v times the radius r here. Substituting for v, the omega r, the angular momentum per unit mass, due only to the rotation of the earth, is going to be big omega r squared. If we again make a substitution of what r is, the angular momentum is big omega a squared, the radius of the earth squared, cosine squared, of latitude phi. Now we want to imagine that we have a parcel. We'll go back to our idea of a parcel, an idealized parcel, a notional particle of air, and we're going to have that having a velocity in the x direction, so into and out of the two-dimensional figure here in the slide we are going to calculate what is the angular momentum of that parcel. And the angular momentum of that parcel is going to be simply the velocity of that parcel in that x, y, z coordinate system. So this is going to be 
the velocity that we observe or the speed that we observe sitting there on the ground with an anemometer and it's going to also be times the same radius of the earth here. So this is the velocity of the parcel of air that we are interested in as we are standing there in our coordinate system with the point of view of being at that surface. It is the wind that we are measuring relative to us. The total angular momentum per unit mass then is simply the sum of these two quantities, the angular momentum of the earth plus the angular momentum of the parcel relative to that coordinate system. If we then take and combine them using the definition of r squared is a squared cosine squared, r here a cosine, combine these together, then we will get that the angular momentum again per unit mass is going to be equal to big R squared times the quantity in parentheses here of big omega, which is the angular velocity of the Earth, plus the velocity here in this x direction, in this case, u over r. And that is the end of this introduction to the angular momentum, and we are now in a position to develop a form of the Coriolis and the centrifugal force to include into our momentum equations.